Hello, thanks for joining us for this COIL conversation. We're really glad you're here. We're, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you and to welcome our presenter for the day, which is Catherine Prince, uh, who just all of a sudden got very pixelated on my screen and came back. It was amazing. As soon as I mentioned your name, there were sparkles everywhere. And <laughs> you're back. Catherine is our featured speaker today. She is a senior director of strategic foresight for KnowledgeWorks. I was telling Brad I could be strategic director for strategic uh, hindsight here at Penn State, but that uh, I don't think there's much call for that. Anyway, Catherine, I, I know Catherine because I saw her work online. I ran into two pieces of her work that made me say, we should talk to this person. Uh, I'll, I'll pop a little piece of the bio in the uh, chat. So Catherine is the uh, senior director, as I mentioned. She also, the two things I saw were recombinant education. You've heard maybe of recombinant DNA. Uh, she, she created a thing called Recombinant Education Regenerating the, e the Learning Ecosystem, and then another document called Learning in 2015. And when I saw those things and thought of all the things we're thinking about here, I thought, well, maybe she'd be willing to share an afternoon with us here, and uh, she has agreed. So with that, Catherine, I'll turn it over to you um, and take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thanks for having me, and thanks all for joining the conversation. So my plan today is to share some insights into the future of learning as um, highlighted by KnowledgeWorks strategic foresight work, and then to have some time for us to converse about them. But as I go along, feel free to um, pop questions into the chat or otherwise clarify um, in the moment, as well as waiting for the more formal conversation time at the end. So KnowledgeWorks is a social enterprise based in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm going to pause just a sec so I can get, figure out the slides. All right, KnowledgeWorks is a social enterprise based in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, where that is working to advance personalized learning for all young people in pursuit of readiness for college, career, and life. And since 2006, we've studied trends shaping the future of learning, looking 10 years out to look at how changes in the world in general pertain to the education sector. And we then work with education stakeholders around the United States to help them explore what those trends might mean for them, how, might they, might, how they might use them to create what they want for learning and better serve students, and, or how they might mitigate some of the potentially negative implications of some of the trends. And we do this work very much because we believe that the future is ours to create, that we're all agents of change in bringing about the future of learning that we would like to see, and that if we're informed about the future, we can be better prepared to guide our actions today. In this, also in doing this work, we do our own research based on the methodologies of the field of strategic foresight, and we also draw upon the research of the Institute for the Future, which for 40 plus years has been looking ahead doing 10-year forecasts on trends shaping the world. So as we look at the landscape over the coming decade, we really see this as a turning point for education, what forecasters often refer to as an era shift, such that the digital revolution and the social and cultural changes that have disrupted it are really catching up with education and disintermediating it. So by that I mean education, um, along with, as we've seen with many other kind of sectors and industries, is experiencing a time where School, as we were used to thinking about it, still exists, but there's more and more ways for learners and their families to kind of take out the middleman and directly engage in their experiences for learning, whether that's on a formal or an informal basis, their entire education or just part of it. So we've seen um, fundamental shifts in other knowledge-based industries, such as publishing and journalism, and it seems that over the next decade, those same kind of shifts could significantly recreate education. And we see this as really an exciting moment uh, because despite the best efforts and stated intentions of many well-meaning and, and successful in many ways educators, our system as a whole is not serving students as to the degree that most of us would want it to. So as we look at the trends shaping the future of learning, we see the potential for an expanding learning ecosystem. So the more and more ways for folks to learn and more ways for us to bring resources and supports available to young people. And our hope is that in its expansion, the future learning ecosystem will be one that is more vibrant for all young people. Um, we're very concerned that 
we could end up instead with a fractured landscape where only those families and learners who have the means and the time and the attention to find their way through um, the future learning ecosystem will thrive. Um, and we want to make sure that as we look ahead, we find ways to think about transforming the education system so that it serves everyone well. So to take a look, I'm drawing upon um, most closely a document from KnowledgeWorks, an infographic called A Glimpse into the Future of Learning, which summarizes our third full forecast on the future of learning. That forecast is the recombinant education document to which Kyle referred. So it's the, the kind of full research base that informs this talk. Um, and then the infographic is a, a higher level story uh, based off that research as well. So as we look ahead, we think we have a tremendous opportunity to redesign learning to suit more students better. And we're already seeing the trends point in the direction of school taking more and more forms. So we're seeing some very more and more kinds of specialized, hyper-focused schools, such as Quest to Learn Charter School in New York City, which organizes its entire pedagogy around systems thinking and gaming. We're also seeing school pop up in new kinds of settings, such as a preschool in the Indianapolis Children's Museum. And we're seeing new platforms for learning abound, whether it's you know, rising rates of homeschooling, unschooling, deschooling, free schooling, the kind of self-organized end of it, whether it's online learning platforms, whether it's new kinds of distributed apprenticeship platforms that might be online or might use online systems to broker connections with place-based mentors, whatever the case may be, we're really seeing the learning landscape diversify and expect that it will continue to do so. Which raises the question for today's educational institutions in terms of you know, what's going to be the particular value proposition, the right role for each organization to play in this expanding landscape. It's no surprise, I'm sure, to any of you that we're, you know, we're not going to see learning be defined by time or place unless that suits a particular learner. So as learners have the opportunity to more and more um, pick the educational experiences that are right for them, they also get to decide when, where, and how they learn. And we're, are, we're seeing some significant signals of change in this direction. I should take a step back and say that the signals of time citing are kind of examples of developments today that we think point in the direction of the future that I'm describing. So in regard to this unbounded learning, we're seeing um, the significant movement toward competency education at the K through 12 and higher education levels. And at the K through 12 level, we already have about 36 states with some kind of policy either requiring or allowing um, students to pursue competency education where they move forward based on mastery of material when they're ready to do so rather than lockstep because they're 12 years old and it's sixth grade and the curriculum says we're doing X, Y, or Z on a certain day. The other dimension of this blending of, of when and where and how learning happens is, of course, technological, the emergence of um, co-presencing technologies technologies and augmented reality, such as the Google Glass, are increasingly giving us opportunities to, um, to, to merge learning settings and, and take learning with us into many kinds of uh, avenues while um, also being connected across those settings. So we think, as we look 10 years out, that learners and their families will have the opportunity to think less about attending a certain school um, unless they might want to, but really to think more so about creating a customized learning playlist that's very tailored to their particular interests, needs, and goals. And we're already seeing some signals pop up in this regard. So we've got online resources such as Learning Paths offering up kind of relatively granular um, learning playlists where you can go on and say, I want to master this English language arts or math objective or I want to learn how to climb Mount Everest, or whatever the objective is, you can state it, and, and it will serve up a variety of resources and a suggested sequence for engaging with them that will help you master that objective. We're also seeing um, the playlist concept come in at the, con at the level of, kind of not just a granular learning objective, but kind of where's the main locus of learning. So Noodle, in 2010, emerged as the first education-specific search engine because already, even now five years ago, um, there were so many educational options proliferating. And indeed, we think that there will be a real spectrum of where and how, le how learners and their families construct their playlists, whether it's 
I go to a fairly traditional brick and mortar school. I might go to a community-based learning hub that's a safe place where I have custodial care, but it opens out learning into a wide range of community-based resources or resources beyond boundaries, or might be any other number of more virtual or distributed settings. We're seeing some public schools also bring the playlist concept in, and Summit Public Schools is one consortium of schools um, that is um, incorporating that playlist concept into the day so that every day begins with students doing work against and checking in on their individualized learning plans and then it also ends with time. doesn't mean they're always learning alone when they're working on their individualized plans. They might be learning in a group, they might be learning with a mentor or a teacher, etc. And they do have common class time as well. So whatever that path, whatever that customized playlist looks like for a particular learner, we're expecting that radical personalization will become the norm so that every child is getting the right approaches and supports at the right time, education really being tailored to that, each learner. And part of this is driven by the increasing uptake in and sophistication of learning analytics so that we have more ability to understand what's happening with learning, and not just with academic performance, but with kind of learners as whole people, thinking also about their, their physical health, their social and emotional well-being, that kind of thing. Um, school of One is one example of a middle school math program that's using a, a, a learning algorithm to every day allocate the, the resources, saying what does each student need to master today, how do they perform and what modalities do they prefer in previous times? What, what are the pre preferred instructional modalities for teachers? And how can we suggest, how can the algorithm suggest that the school use its resources that day? Um, we're also seeing non-technologically enabled approaches to this personalization. So one, one aspect of it is the increasing understanding of cognitive function, our um, deepening knowledge of how motivation works, so just understanding more and more about the mind will, it promises to help educators and other supporters of education um, support young people better along their journeys. But we're also seeing moves just to create more space for interest-based learning in relatively traditional school settings. The Genius Hour is one of those, so it's a global network of teachers that have committed to following the principle that Google uses, whereby the company allows allocates, um, leaves 20% of its software engineers time unallocated so that they have time to explore and innovate because the company knows that those bright people will come with, up with ideas on their own that the company couldn't dictate or plan for in a formal way. So the Genius Hour movement takes this similar principle into education to say, could we carve out time within the traditional classroom structure up to 20% or, or less, some amount of time for students to explore their interests. Because how will we move toward kind of really personalized learning with some degree for students to not necessarily dictate what they learn, but how they learn it, and maybe what they learn, depending on kind of um, what people design, um, if students never have time to, under, to explore their interests. Um, I see some questions going on about um, would we be able to um, would we be, not learn math or that kind of thing if we um, pursue these kinds of changes? And certainly that's, that's one possibility. I think it's very possible also for um, this kind of customization of pathway and certainly for the personalization of supports within a pathway to exist also in the context of robust standards that you know, indicate there's a, there's a minimum um, set of objectives that every student should master. We can talk more about that in the discussion. Um, so following on from the idea that how we support learning and where learning is happening is diversifying, we also project that educators' roles will diversify and indeed become more specialized. So we're seeing the potential for what we call new learning agent roles to emerge. And so with our last forecast at, in 2009, we started using the term learning agent just to help people imagine jobs in the education sector that were not that we have today, today, the traditional teacher administrator at the K through 12 level or professor at the higher education level. So we're seeing some organizations and models begin to um, diversify roles. And, and we also see the potential for um, much more to evolve in this direction. The Center for Teaching Quality is one of the organizations that's exploring 
hybrid roles for teachers at the K through 12 level, trying to find new structures um, to support and remunerate teachers for um, who want to stay in the classroom, but also who want to assume leader posi leadership positions to to do that. So they're supporting teachers um, in current schools in becoming what they call teacherpreneurs. So they are still teaching part of the time, but they might be advocating for policy or working with communities in new ways, might be change agents in some formal way, a trustee of a system, that kind of thing. Um, and they're really trying to push against the trend that there's kind of one main career um, for teachers. There's not much of a career lattice, not much of a development path unless someone wants to leave the classroom and become an administrator. So they're trying to diversify teaching roles in that way. We also saw um, Danville Schools in Kentucky apply to use its um, staff funding in new ways as part of its application to the state under Kentucky's Districts of Innovation model. So that district petitioned to use diversify its teaching role, teaching funding into two roles an interdis interdisciplinary learning designer that's kind of a learning architect, helping students craft their learning journeys, and then teaching assistants who were doing some of the more routine teaching related tasks, such as proctoring exams, um, helping students maybe carry out pieces of their plans, but less of an architect role. They also petitioned to use their uh, guidance counselor funding in an expanded success coach role that would have taken a much broader view of student performance and student health. Um, the competency education movement is another place where we're seeing a diversification of roles, and particularly here at the higher education level. Western Governors University and um, the other universities that I've looked at who are pursuing a competency-based approach are typically also changing their staffing structures so that um, they're separating the delivery of instruction from its evaluation. They typically have course teams um, who are designing courses versus the, and then and then roles such as student and course mentors who are helping support the delivery of courses. And those those course teams or program faculty, as Western Governors calls them, are bringing in people from the workplace as well as academic experts and program managers, those kinds of roles, to help make sure that the competencies to which they're teaching align with the employment-related outcomes for any given degree. So I think um, this is a pretty exciting development, and we're doing some, some new work. To, we, we did some work on potential learning agent roles some years ago, but we're doing a new project on this at the moment. Um, Turning our attention more to the context in which learning happens, we're seeing um, with the culture of um, do-it-yourself culture and, and more of a the sharing economy that's emerging, some of these other trends are pointing toward um, a landscape in which community ownership of learning has the potential to really deepen and broaden. So you know, schools and universities have, of course, been working with communities in various ways for many years. But we're seeing the potential for a new level of community ownership that really has the potential both to extend a, a shared sense of outcomes, but also to take learning into communities in new ways and make many kinds of community resources sites for learning. So a couple of signals of change pointing in this direction include the Providence After School Alliance. So that's a it's a a nonprofit working closely with both the public, the Providence, Rhode Island Public School District, and lots of the local nonprofits, to bring after-school learning into the two district students in a very structured way, often directly into the building, so the students still have a, a safe and secure place to learn. But the Providence After School Alliance is really serving as a broker that's helping to provide these extended learning opportunities in collaboration with the school district, and they're also doing some kind of co-development of teachers in the district and student supporters in the nonprofits so that they are working together toward um, a holistic view and a common understanding of outcomes for students. They're also starting to explore how to badge those experiences. Um, the Los Angeles Public Library is another example of a community institution becoming a learning institution in a new way, a more formalized way. So they. Um, not too long ago, announced that they will start to award high school diplomas rather than just um, being in formal learning, uh, being an informal learning resource. 
um, and, and they're particularly targeting and rewarding those diplomas, adult learners who have dropped out of the traditional system. And they're requiring that those learners come to the library and participate in an in-person community of learning in addition to having distributed learning support um, that fits into the rest of their lives. Another dimension of this, of this ownership of learning is not, not so much about where learning happens or who's contributing to the actual learning experiences, but more about the sense of shared accountability for learning, the idea of communities owning learning in new ways. And again, um, we're seeing a move for people not to wait for educational institutions or governments or, or other kinds of organizations to find solutions, but to step forward and work together in kind of collaborative or crowdsourced ways to address resource constraints and other challenges. So part of how this move toward finding shared solutions and, um, and, and having more kind of community and, or grassroots empowerment in doing that is the collective impact movement in education and in other sectors. And full disclosure, KnowledgeWorks um, supports one collective impact approach through our Strive Together subsidiary. But basically, collective impact brings together educational stakeholders in a community, the, the public schools, the universities and community colleges, the many kinds of nonprofits and other organizations that support learners, and helps communities have a common articulation of shared outcomes for learning as well as aligned data systems for understanding how all their efforts are going towards supporting learning. And then also being able then to align funding behind that. The map here is an example of the University of New Mexico mapping kind of college, um, college, college completion time based on the sending high, school, sending high school in the Albuquerque area. So how long does it take a student to graduate from college based on what high school in Albuquerque they attended to? So there's a piece here in this finding of shared solutions that's driven by um, our increasing ability to surface data in real time and understanding what's happening in our communities and being able to see those patterns and, and use them in meaningful ways. Um, this other example here, where's my school bus, is an example of that, that kind of real-time data and also of a collaboration of perhaps unlikely partners. So in this, in this example, the Boston um, Public School District collaborated with a nonprofit called Code for America that brings in coders to solve problems in a very targeted way and then leaves and goes on to the next problem. Um, it, this happened in, after a, the winter of 2011 when Boston had really bad storms, and the district was getting about 3,000 calls a day from students and families asking where the school bus was. So Code for America developed an app for them called Where's My School Bus that not only surfaces that information for people to access in an easier way, but also lets um, students and families input data so they can say, I saw the school bus. I'm getting on it now. And that helps inform the information in the application. Um, Another piece of this is the diversification of credentialing. Again, if learning is happening in more ways, we're, we're owning it in new ways. We also have the potential to think about credentialing it in new ways. And we're definitely seeing a diversification of credentials and certificates and other kinds of markers of learning. A critical uncertainty, as my colleague Jason Swanson, who's, who's on the webinar, has highlighted in a paper that's just about to come out is the degree to which um, the employment sector will accept new forms of credentialing. That, that, that's a critical uncertainty that will kind of have a lot of sway in terms of de in determining how far this, the emergence of these new credentials goes in, in disrupting the K through 12 and the higher education sectors. But in the meantime, we are seeing a proliferation of kinds of credentials. So place institutions such as the Smithsonian setting up quests to inspire people to explore using their resources and, and others available in their communities, and then badging them for the pursuit of those quests. We're seeing Udacity offer nano degrees, so very short courses in collaboration with companies such as AT&T or Salesforce and Google to learn very, so that students can learn very specialized skills in a very targeted way and then get credentialed for it and so forth. We're also seeing like less formal credentialing platforms emerged. Where, where learners can self-certify their learning. And Degreed, which is depicted at the bottom here, is one of those. And that's this platform lets anyone go in and say, 
can add up all their learning experiences to say how close am I to the equivalent of a bachelor's degree so it can accommodate formal college courses, work experience, informal learning experiences, kind of the whole gamut of possibilities and help people have some approximation of um, equivalency to the degree. So as, as I said, not widely accepted yet, except uh, in certain sectors such as the tech industry where we're seeing more inroads of alternative credentials, but there's definitely development here. And if you think about how we might use the develop these developments in concert with designing new systems of learning and new supports for learning, we could end up with some pretty interesting future possibilities. Um, the last big area to take a look at here is the evolution of work. And that's enorm an enormous contextual factor for education. Obviously, just one purpose of education, preparing people for uh, success in careers. But it's an important context. So we're seeing um, the future of work evolve very rapidly um, with a decline of full-time employment, such that ad hoc employment is much more likely to is, is likely to be much more common than it is today. Already, we're seeing platforms such as Odesk um, provide kind of matchmaking services to match up people with any number of professional skills, whether it's a web developer, an editor, an app developer, um, with an organization or an individual who wants to purchase their time. And so it can be, um, it, it enables the employment react transaction or the employment relationship to end up happening at a very kind of granular level. It's not all rosy. It can create a great deal of uncertainty. And there's um, unions like, um, popping up in this space, kind of a new, way, a new form of union to help protect workers' rights. But we're definitely seeing um, a fragmentation of the full-time employment as a dominant form of career. Uh, we're also seeing automation continue to impact um, the world of work. And to, to, to come into new layers where we, um, we thought it might have been less likely. So um, this is kind of a fun example. This bottom picture here is from a restaurant in China that's staffed entirely by robots. So the food is cooked by robots, the waiters are robots, the dishwashers are robots. Um, and that's a, a kind of a, a extreme example. And I'm uh, not sure how widespread that kind of thing will get. But we're, um, we're seeing automation um, impinge in more and more ways. And I think for people who really specialize in the future of work, the verdict's out whether it will create more jobs or different jobs. But there's a lot of conversation now looking at services such as Uber and looking at what kind of jobs are going to be above the API line where um, you know, folks who write the programs um, that dispatch services are relatively well compensated, what jobs are going to be below the API line. So like in the Uber example, the drivers who are dispatched by the app. And, and are those jobs going to be um, less remunerative and less satisfying and, and more dead end than they had been before? So there's some really interesting and, and potentially disruptive potential for fracture and disruption in employment in the employment landscape. And the bottom line for education is that we're, we're likely to be facing a climate of continuous career readiness of many more individuals kind of having mosaic careers or holding multiple jobs, even in very different kinds of jobs concurrently to add up to close enough to full-time employment to support themselves. And that's going to create a very different climate for learning. So that's my tour of um, the future trends, as our research has highlighted. Some questions for reflection that we're welcome to pop back to in the conversation in a bit here um, include kind of what value proposition might you or your organization undertake to contribute effectively in this expanding learning ecosystem that I've been describing? What new kinds of infrastructure or any connections do we need to create to make it really vibrant for all learners to avert that fractured landscape scenario that I outlined at the beginning? Um, how can you or, or, or your organization begin to help learners access a wider range of learning opportunities now? Um, and how might you support the creation of new kinds of roles that support greater personalization of learning for everyone? There's the potential also, of course, to consider new kinds of partnerships toward new solutions and to think about how education might need to shift to help better prepare students for the changes in work that I described. So we really are excited about this future in some ways. I think it has the opportunity to open up um, new, new solutions and really make 
more learning landscapes more vibrant for more people. Um, we're also, as I mentioned, very concerned that it will not be an equitable future and that there could be um, a lot more kids left behind than there are today. So as we think about how we can move toward our ideal future, this equitable vision of learning so where we have a learning ecosystem that is more modular and interoperable than the dominant system is today, it, it's also resilient, it's equitable, it's vibrant, and serving all young people well. Uh, we created, based on our conversations with folks around the country, um, a set of innovation, an innovation pathways framework to help think about, OK, it's seeming more and more possible to personalize learning in the ways that I'm describing to move toward this vibrant learning ecosystem. Um, how can we begin to transform the current system of learning to get to move in that direction? So our in, this innovation pathways framework looks at ways we might transform the core of learning, so that what's directly happening around learners and with learners, and how we might also transform supporting, supporting systemic structures, so things like quality assurance frameworks and funding and policy and public will that can enable or constrain what can happen in our learning ecosystems. We can, um, so this is a resource we can talk more about if helpful, um, but we see the potential to really use these future trends to shift the education conversation far beyond the reform conversation that's dominated certainly the K through 12 landscape in recent years to really one of, of transformation, thinking about creating really entirely new learning ecosystems that might include our current educational institutions but are broader than them or might simply be more diverse so you have just a wider array of options that learners are partaking of so that much more tailored to what is appropriate to each person at a given point in time instead of kind of being you know, being one or two dominant models that people can opt into but but not a great degree of of choice choice or personalization um, so with all that offered I will open up the conversation these are a couple of questions that I had which are what about this glimpse of the future do you find exciting what raises questions or concerns? I know there's a lot going on in the chat that I haven't really been able to, to follow while talking, so but feel free to surface anything from there as well or, or take the conversation indeed in another direction. Great. Thank you, uh, Catherine. I appreciate your, uh, your kicking things off. I think there's probably any two minutes of what you just said that could stimulate an hour of conversation. The, I don't think we've ever had, Brad, have we ever had a chat box that was this active? Uh, no, everybody, you've got everybody thinking, and uh, I'm sure people are thinking more than they're putting in the chat box, too. So I, I don't think that will be difficult at all. Uh, because there's been so much in the chat box, let's just say if you have a question you'd like to ask, and you've already asked it, please re-enter it, and we'll sort of monitor the chat box as we move forward. Uh, in the meantime, if you're in the room here with us, we have microphones. Just indicate that you have a question, and we'll pass you a microphone. And uh, so that it gets recorded uh, and everyone out there can hear it. Questions? Catherine, I will pull one thing out of the uh, chat box that was going on for about 10 minutes, this back and forth discussion on the increased importance of uh, students being goal oriented uh, in this new model and the concerns how that might play into socioeconomic status and opportunities that are in place. Uh, what are what are your thoughts on that, particularly with the like I said, the increased role of uh, being a goal-oriented individual? Perhaps when you're 10, 12 years old, you may have a concierge that's that's helping walk you through this, but there's an onus still on you. There is, and so part of what we see is the need to build young people's capacity to take greater ownership of their learning. And this is a core part of, of what we kind of outline in the learning culture's innovation pathway. Um, but it's, you know, it goes far beyond that as, as well. Um, you know, we can't expect somebody just to, to be in a you know, seventh grade classroom or wherever they are today and then tomorrow enter this new system and know how to operate effectively in it. We need to both you know, help people have transitional supports to the degree that an individual is kind of in that transitional moment, and also um, do more to educate learners about learning. To um, I think help them develop kind of their their metacognitive skills, their understanding of their own learning. We also need to build in 
systemic supports that acknowledge that not all learners will be always in a place where they're going to be prone to do that. And so what if they're not? Um, so there, or do there need to be kind of learning agents who have very specialized roles that help learners um, who, are, who are not going to be as goal-oriented, but help them find effective ways um, toward mastering what they need to do um, to thrive? Um, we've also been thinking a lot about this question of what counts as educational success or how do different cultures define educational success in the context of a, a paper we're just wrapping up on looking at um, what kinds of interconnections we might foster across these expanding learning ecosystems to help make them vibrant and equitable for everyone. Um, and it, it seems that we need, very important to develop learning ecosystems and particular solutions that reflect the realities of given geographies and given communities within those geographies. So um, to acknowledge you know, some, some learners in high need geographies or particularly difficult circumstances are going to be prone to be focusing on very short term goals, even survival, um, basic needs like food and security and shelter. And there also could be you know, a little less dire level kind of cultural narratives that um, don't necessarily place the same value on formal education as we might. And so we need to find ways to help learners um, have high aspirations in those contexts, in those realities. And, and we think that designing um, and cultivating flexible learning ecosystems that are very responsive to those particular local needs and conditions is going to be important. Thank you. Well, my follow-up question was going to be about the, the role of place in all of this. And, and you just hit on that. Mm -hmm. Other questions in the room? Or uh, online? Well, I'll, seeing none at the moment, I'll go ahead and ask uh, mine. <clears throat> it seems like a big part of this expanding learning ecosystem is going to be assessments and tracking of all this. Uh, what are you hearing from you know, people that you're working with, consulting with, and the leading schools and higher education institutions about sort of making sense of, of tracking the learning that goes on as it all becomes more personalized and as people start grabbing learning outcomes from different sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the current conversation, I think there are two main avenues in that regard. One, one about our, our systems of formal assessment and quality assurance, and one about the data privacy and security issues. And they're, they're both really important pieces of that conversation and just pieces of it. Um, so where we had a moment that was very promising. Um, two or three years ago when um, in Bloom and other groups were, were trying to think in new ways about creating student information systems that really connected up in much more integrated ways um, than, our, than the dominant or traditional student information systems did. And we've had, they got out in front of the, the public will and there's been a huge backlash. But um, so I think we're in a very sensitive moment around data privacy and security. Um, but we've got organizations like the Data Quality Campaign and others that are doing good work in helping people think through that terrain and um, get out of that panic mode. And that's really important to do because we won't be able to enable these kinds of really effective ecosystems if we can't think about new forms of data infrastructure. Um, and and we, we need, I think, to do more to, to, to work through what is it we really need to track and understand about learning. Um, Jason's paper on the, the future of credentialing kind of helped me have a more nuanced understanding of um, the potential for new technologies such as learning record stores to, that might capture informal in, or formal instances of learning and, and, and tag them up into a system that could look at that learning against objectives. Um, those kinds of developments, if not that particular technology, things in that direction might help us do more targeted observation and data collection that it helps, again, um, address the privacy and security concerns because it might not feel as comprehensive. So there's, I think there's some traction to explore there. On the assessment and accountability side, I think in the K through 12 level, we're in a very challenging place um, as, we continue, as, as we continue to have the, the constraints of No Child Left Behind and the, or the Education and Secondary Education Act. We, you know, and, and we would not, as an organization, say we don't need accountability. We do, but we need to think about new forms of quality assurance that are more reflective of the learning system that, to which we aspire. We are encouraged, as, as the 
shift toward competency education gains sway. We're starting to see some exploration um, in state education systems around assessment. And New Hampshire just got approval to explore new summative assessments that are consistent with its approach to competency education. Um, so, in fact, they got a waiver from the federal requirements to explore a new angle on the, the question. There's a lot more work to be done there. Um, and, it's, and I think the, the conversation is it's still very based on where we are today and less based on where we might want it to go than we would like to see. Thank you. Larry, I believe you have a question. Do you want to uh, turn on your mic? and? Yes, thank you. Um, boy, Catherine, uh, as Kyle said, you, you've given us a lot to think about here and uh, a lot to uh, reflect on. Um, I have a list of about 12 questions, so I'm going to have to narrow it. I think my best one is. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm wondering about, first of all, can I just say that um, I love the idea, I love the, the concept of the recombinant uh, learning system. Um, I am, and, and, and I really, really appreciate the thought about teaching learning, uh, teaching students how to learn from a very, very early age, that this is something we don't necessarily do really well right now. And in order for them to become um, responsible selectors of a path and the methods by which they learn, I, I think they really have to first be taught those uh, metacognitive skills, and, and we're not doing that really well. But here's my question. Do you think in, in this, in your current planning, that you're conflating uh, the idea of the ecosystem uh, from choosing their path to a certain set of goals? And by that, I mean, if we, if we think about this really, really large, it gets a little scary, like different people going off in different directions. And so you have somebody who's called a surgeon, but boy, when I found out what path he took and what skill sets he has, it turns out I do not want him uh, operating on my knee. I want somebody who has, you know, taken a path where they've actually held a scalpel or whatever. I'm exaggerating. The, in the second, so that that's scary. That large space is really scary because it suggests that people select their own goals, uh, which means I'm, I'm now uh, concerned about the credentials they hold and their, their performance of those uh, skill sets uh, against the idea of maybe choosing their own path so that we say, here are the skill sets that you need to be to have and the competencies you need to be able to demonstrate as whatever, as a surgeon or whatever. How you get there in this ecosystem, this landscape is varied so long as in the end you wind up with demonstrating um, your competence. Does that make sense? It does and I, th I think you are drawing an important distinction and um, I probably was collapsing some of that and, and they are separate questions. So we could all have the same learning objectives and not to get into a debate about Common Core, but we could all have high standards, whatever they were, and, and have many pathways toward achieving them. Um, and and that could, so we could have a great deal of customization of pathway and personalization of support along whatever pathway and all ha and have a, a fairly standard understanding of where everyone needs to end up. Um, and in our current climate, that's probably a fairly likely scenario that we would still have at the state level um, sets of standards that the K through 12 students would need to attain. I think there is some move afoot to say we need high standards, but we can also have some space for learners to pursue interests in addition to them, to some room to say at a younger age I can start to customize what I learn. So to say, for example, I mean, it would, be, it would be perhaps a little more like the British system, you know, where you could people start to specialize earlier. So there, there might be a little, I think there could be more room in a, in a standards-based environment to have um, more interest-based collaborative learning. And there's also possible, this, that would be at the outcome level, at the learning experience level, I think there's certainly room to say we all are, need to attain the same standards, but we can learn them through our interests. So that could go into the pathway piece. Um, on the credentialing side of things, um, in your point about surgeons, absolutely, there are going to be certain 
certain highly specialized fields where people need very particular training and we need to make sure that those certifying that the accomplishment of that training um, are legitimate. And um, indeed, as, as Jason looked at the future of credentialing, I think in none of the scenarios did that go away. We, even if um, credentialing was diversifying for many kinds of jobs or many kinds of skills, we still felt that um, certain very highly specialized fields would probably are, always have some form of um, high stakes summative assessment or needing to prove real attainment. Um, I've held that scalpel. I haven't just done an online simulation, that kind of thing. Can I just follow up and then I'll, I'll release the mic. I'll put my mic on mute. Um, is there a good place to start uh, in this environment with the, the, the recombinant and uh, idea of the entire system? In other words, you know, so at Penn State, we're unlikely next year or in the next, I don't know, five years to like, completely abandon all of the structures we have and all of the organizational um, advantages and the administrative and the academic and such. It's, it's highly unlikely that's going to go away. I'm wondering, is there, a, is there a safe place that we can look to, perhaps it's not credit-based, where, I'm, I don't know, I'm thinking of volunteer organizations or I'm thinking of um, uh, clubs or some place that we can begin testing the, the, the whole system in totality to see because I, I my sense is the congruency has to be there and by doing it in pieces and parts we might not experience that congruency uh, and again I'm just going to sign off here but thank you so much for your uh, for your talk you're welcome I, I you know I think you're re raising a really important point and, and the, that's one of the arguments I made in the innovation pathways paper that you can't change your learning structures only and end up with a different system of learning. We need to change, you know, the many things that go into learning. Um, you know, if you still have the same accountability or quality assurance system, changing the learning structure is only going to get you so far toward a different system, for example, just to pick out one pathway. Um, I think that for institutions such as um, yours, finding ways to um, experiment or innovate alongside the current system could be a, a safe route forward. So thinking about um, what would today be considered informal or extended learning opportunities and um, that wouldn't get you to a truly holistic system in that it would be operating alongside your current one. But thinking about how might students begin to augment that and then and then thinking about well, might, could there be degrees then of, of engagement in the traditional way or the new way as things evolved. We're seeing um, you know, the idea of innovation zones appear in various settings and, and that could be um, an idea to think about applying to your setting. So a space to say, um, you know, we're going to suspend some of the rules or the regulations or just, or just create a culture that supports um, risk and entrepreneurship and is going to be in continuous learning mode and trying things. Um, it's it's very challenging, and and I wouldn't argue that we we need to abandon all our current institutions and all our educational wisdom and, and traditions in thinking about a new set of ecosystems. But we need to think carefully about how our current institutions can contribute to ecosystems in in ways that are appropriate to learners' needs in the future. So I would say thinking also about how to span boundaries might be a key strategy, whether it's with new kinds of community partners or partners that just have a functional um, um, synergy but might not be based where you are, could be another kind of avenue to explore. Thanks. This is Casey Fenton. Um, I think the idea that uh, education can become, uh, the, the constraints of time and space could be removed from it is a really interesting one. And at the structural level, I feel like that's really hard to conceptualize or to think about what that looks like. But I'm wondering, are there, are there examples like at the institutional level or the program level or even the class level where they have kind of removed those constraints and 
innovative ways and, and what are those and what does it look like? Mm. Yeah, I would say that the most prominent example at the moment is this move toward competency education that I've been alluding to. So, I mean, that's basically saying we don't care how long you sit in the seat, we care what you learn. So, um, both at the K through 12 and the higher education levels, a um, variety of state systems at the K through 12 levels and a variety of institutions at the higher ed level are looking at different ways of pursuing that. Um, so it, it can be as straightforward as you still take fixed courses, but you go through them at your own pace. And maybe you also have credit for prior learning or for ancillary learning that happens in other settings other than the formal institution one, but the institution awards credit or assesses competency or mastery in relation to the, the institution's own offerings. Um, so I think you know that's a that's a very promising development. I mean I think we're seeing a lot of a blurring of um, time and place also happen in what we today consider to be the informal or the community-based learning sector. Um, so I think looking at wh what's developing there where we don't have the constraints of seat time you know, that, had a, that had dominated our current systems, our current formal systems, are there developments there that um, we might learn, draw upon to think about you know, using those kinds of approaches more broadly? The credentialing piece is a big one here um, and one of the big uncertainties. If we start credentialing less, less formal or a greater variety of experiences, um, Either within the context of institutions or apart from them, you know, if if that they, if those kinds of credentials become more widely accepted, that could be one of the big game changers that would shift a system. Thanks. Online, we have a question from Renee, and you've you've somewhat touched on this, but I thought it might be important to ask the question directly. Uh, what do you see as the biggest barrier of us getting from where we are right now to a more widespread implementation of the new systems? Um, I think societal will is a big barrier, um, and I and I think I I specifically say that in regard to the question of equity. Will the expanded learning ecosystem that looks like it's emerging be an equitable one? Um, yeah, I know we state that we want it to be. I'm not sure that we really have the will to put our resources behind that. I hope we do. I think from an institutional perspective, um, institutional legacy can be a big barrier. Um, you know, any institution, any individual is going to be attached to how we're used to doing things, and um, that's just that's the reality of people, even those of us who look to the future. Um, and we need to think, I think, carefully about what we want to retain, one approach to another, um, and what we want to let go of. And that, that can take a lot of courage and a lot of um, extensive change management at an institutional or at a societal level. Questions, anyone? Yes, uh, Ming. Hi, it's Ming. Can you hear me? Can. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. OK. Um, in the combination uh, education, you discussed the customized value webs. And in this part, you said the BYOD movement may will turn into a uh, create your own school movement to raise um, the value webs. And me and other research in China using open edX created a new learning platform to provide our own work courses on it, and our students can also provide their own course on this site. So my question is, what role you think the educators should play in the uh, Create Your Own School movement? Thank you. Um, what role should educators play in the Create Your Own School movement? Um, I think that that um, could vary uh, depending on the objective of those creating the school. But um, I would say generally I think that we need educators who are serving as guides in, as learners design their pathways, whether it's a um, pathway through a, 
a public district, a new kind of school, um, a mosaic experience, whatever it might be. As we work on um, thinking about forecasting educator roles um, for the next 10 years, we are looking at one called a learning pathway designer that we think could work in many kinds of settings, institutional or not, serving kind of as a guide or a Sherpa who understands that the learner as a whole person, knows that learner as a whole person, understands about learning development and cognitive development, but can also um, bring, kind of help the learner know what pathways might be useful and kind of bring together the many people who might contribute to a, a learning journey. Um, you know, there are many other kinds of educator roles that's, that could support um, young people, or learners generally, in a, in a create your own school type movement. Um, we're seeing some of the alt schools that are popping up, so kind of schools self-organized by small groups. Um, you know, they typically employ a few fairly traditional teachers, um, but um, they also do a lot of broker of um, relationships with experts and mentors in the communities and beyond to help students access knowledge beyond that of those teachers. So I think there's a, especially if we start to think about learning agent roles in a more gen, more diversified way and not necessarily thinking of all of them being part-time. In fact, some of them might be pretty micro and they might not all be paid and that has its own host of positive and negative implications we could talk about for a long time. But if we, if we really open up our thinking about who is an educator or a learning agent and how, how he or she might support learning, I think there are a lot of rich ways to consider adults or more experienced individuals working with a learner in even very, um, very self-organized approaches to learning. Did you want to ask Larry's question? Sure. Hi. Uh, Larry had one more question. I think he uh, doesn't want to turn the mic back on because he promised he wouldn't. So uh, Larry had the question of, if you might suggest a single step to begin the process, what might it be? I think one of the most important things to consider is um, what kind of learning culture a group or an institution wants to create. Um, so thinking about that in combination with setting an aspirational vision for what learning sh might look like, um, but I think, but I, but I, I, I started off this journey with this forecast thinking a lot more about learning structures, and I think they're very important. But I've increasingly come to think that if we don't change our learning cultures, we won't change the ecosystem significantly. So. Um, is, do we want? Do you want to have a learning culture that's inquiry-based, that makes space for pay, play, that is more accommodating of risk, whatever it might be? And, and there are many possible learning cultures, and far be it for me to say which one is right for any group of people. But to to be really clear about what culture um, we want to foster, because that's something that can be built within current structures, and then might help drive the evolution of current structures to the extent that any given structure needs to change to deliver on the longer term vision. Well, I think that, uh, that I, I'm peeking over the edge. I, I'm like, what was that, <laughs> Wilson on uh, tool time or something? No, let's do it. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, Catherine, for a great session. I think that was a great uh, note on which to end. Uh, and Larry, a good question to sort of cap things off. Um, we have a lot of people here who uh, are thinking about where education is going. A lot of people all around the world. I, th I think this is an incredibly exciting time in the history of education. And I'm very glad there are people out there like you who are uh, working to help people think deeply and systemically about uh, the kinds of things that are possible and the kinds of changes and combinations of things that have to change in order to get us there. So thanks for stimulating our thinking. And I hope uh, sometime in the future we can bring you out for a face-to-face -face visit. So uh, you mentioned another paper coming out in the fall or something. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that as we close? Sure. Um, we have three about to come out or coming out soon. We're hard at work. Well, actually, 
explore things. So very soon, and within the, in about two weeks, Jason's paper on the future of credentialing that I've been alluding to will be out. Um, probably within a, a month to six weeks, our paper on looking at um, cultivating vibrant learning ecosystems will be out. It's the one looking at interconnections and new kinds of structural roles within the ecosystem. Then in the summer, we'll be publishing um, a new set of learning agent roles that we think uh, might be provocative for considering future possibilities. And then lastly, in September, at the end of September, we expect to publish our fourth full forecast on the future of learning, looking again at a refresh on the trends and the critical uncertainties for the field. Great. Well, thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Brad and Haley, who are our technical crew, who uh, you know make all this possible. They have quite a little road show that they uh, that they put on here, and uh, with, we thank you all for coming. Thanks, and see you next time. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed the conversation.